Hello, welcome everybody to our lecture on graph learning. Can you hear me and can you see the slides? Very good. So before I start with uh, graph learning methods, one comment about the Federated Learning Project. As you know, you are only allowed to use uh, machine learning models as local models. So here we use one separate machine learning model for each node in an empirical graph. And the list of allowed models is uh, provided at the My Courses page under Federated Learning Project section. And you might feel that this limits you because you want to, for example, use non-numeric data in your project like text. Uh, but I want to point out that you are free to choose and construct features. So you could transform the text into numeric feature vectors and then use these numeric feature vectors as the input to, to some basic model like linear model. Uh, you are free to choose the features of a data point. So you could choose the features also by applying some powerful uh, deep <clears throat> learning method <clears throat> for extracting numeric features or embeddings. These are often called embeddings for words or text uh, data. The important thing is that you clearly define and describe how you obtain these features that you then feed into a uh, one of these more basic models that you are allowed to use in the project. Are there any other comments, uh, questions regarding the, the allowed models for the project? Okay. So today I want to talk about basic techniques or approaches to find the empirical graph or to come up with good choices of the empirical graph. So remember the setting in federated learning within this course is that we have local data sets. So we have one local data set at each node. A node could represent a data scientist that collects data while, uh, during experiments. And beside the local data sets, we also have local models. So each data scientist might want to train a, a, a optimal or a, a tailored model for the data he or she is uh, observing. Um, and in our setting, within this course, we allow completely different models for different nodes. So one node, for one node, you could use a linear model for another node, you could use uh, polynomial models or deep neural networks. We couple these models by comparing their predictions on a common test set. So we could say this, the difference between this hypothesis, for example, or this red one hypothesis and this other hypothesis, H superscript J, we measure by comparing its predictions, their predictions on a common test set. And these predictions, they should be not too, too different. And the difference is weighted by the, the weight of the edge. So that's the idea of, of uh, this FL federated learning design principle. So we want to, on one hand, we want to train local models. So we want to find a hypothesis for each node that has a small loss. And this loss could be, for example, the average loss on a, on a training set. So here we have a training set that we use to formulate the, the local loss functions here. And we want to, let's say, minimize the average. Uh, we could maybe also aggregate them in a different way. So we, we want to minimize the, the maximum of all local loss functions. But for this course, we only use the average as the criterion, as a, a global criterion of, of the trained local models. And we want to also couple these local models by requiring the, the hypothesis that we learn at different nodes to agree um, on a test set. So we use this discrepancy measure here. This discrepancy measure could be obtained from comparing the predictions on a common test set, or if we use parametric models, 
uh, we could compare, for example, where the Euclidean norm, the weight vectors or parameter vectors of the local hypothesis maps. But this only works if we use parametric models. If we use non-parametric models, then we must use other uh, means to measure this variation. Okay, so the question now today is, or that we try to answer today, what should we use for the edge? Which edges should we use? What edges should be, should we place an edge between these two nodes? Yes or no? And also what, what weight should this edge have? So we also remember in an empirical graph, we have edges and we have non <clears throat> or positive numbers, which are the weights that they measure the amount of similarity between those two nodes. So these are non-negative or positive. And yeah, so graph learning methods allow to, to come up with principled ways to decide if there should be an edge between two nodes and what should be the weight of the edge. Okay, so does any one of you have uh, ideas or any proposal how we could find out what, what good edges are or which edge set we should use in this GTV minimization? We could consider these edges and the weights as uh, model parameters, as a kind of hyperparameter of the whole federated learning system. So how, how can we choose uh, hyperparameters or how do we tune hyperparameters in general? When you apply machine learning methods, they might have or might involve hyperparameters, tuning parameters. How do you choose them? Yeah, you could come up with a, a probabilistic model. So you could do base model selection. But uh, if you don't want to use a, a probabilistic model, so you want to avoid a Bayesian approach, what is, what is the standard answer always that I, I use? Uh, for choosing hyperparameters or model parameters. Well, it's the basic idea of all applied machine learning. It's trial and error. So we could try out different choices for the edges and the edge weights. So we try out one specific collection of edges and edge weights. Then we solve this uh, optimization problem, this GTV minimization. And the result of this GTV minimization are trained models or, or yeah, hypotheses. So we would obtain a learned hypothesis for node I and another learned hypothesis for node J. And what we then can do is we validate the, the learned models or the trained models by computing validation errors. So it, we, we use some data points of the local data sets as validation sets and we compute the validation errors. So we validate the, the trained local models and pick the one uh, or we try out different choices for the edges and for the edge weights and pick the one with smallest validation error. So that's the the generic answer, which might be actually the most useful one in, in certain applications. Any comments on this approach? How do you feel about this approach? Yeah, and by the way, this we can also use, we might also use this approach for tuning lambda, this regularization parameter. Yeah, it is a lot of trial and error and it might be wasteful. So it might be wasteful and we, the kind of the, the art of machine learning or uh, a goal in machine learning, in mach machine learning science is to find out most efficient ways to, to need as little trials, uh, as few trials as possible. Yeah, it might waste computational resources, exactly. Uh, so let's now talk about some other approaches that might be quicker, so that would require less trial. And these approaches, they often need some assumption on the data. 
So one assumption on the data is that the data points are IID realizations or IID draws from a common underlying probability distribution. So this is the famous IID assumption in machine learning, maybe the most popular probabilistic um, uh, model of all machine learning, the IID assumption. And what sets now federated learning apart from plain vanilla or plain machine learning is that we have this IID assumption for each local data set. So per se, each local data set comes from one separate uh, probability distribution. So we have one probability distribution for node i, and we have another probability distribution from node j. Okay, so it seems now reasonable to connect such uh, nodes if the probability distribution underlying their data is identical or very similar to each other, because then the statistical properties of the, the data points in this local data set i are very similar to the statistical properties of the data points in the data set J. In particular, they might both be used or pulled together to train a single model. So they might be pulled together to obtain a larger training set for a deep neural network. So that's the basic idea in, in, in what I talk about now in, in the rest of the lecture. So we assume that each local data set is made up of IID realizations. So we interpret each data point as being obtained from drawing from a probability distribution. And this probability distribution might be different for each node. So learning an empirical graph then means learning or estimating distances between these probability distributions. So we want to find the distance, a distance measure between a probability distribution at node i and probability distribution at node j. So how do we measure this distance? How could we measure this distance? Does anyone have suggestions? Yeah, we could use a KL divergence. Yes, KL divergence, I will talk about in a second. Uh, but can we directly measure the KL divergence between the probability distributions of these uh, local data sets? So what I want to point out or emphasize here is that we often or most, most of the times we do not know the probability distributions. We just assume it's a modeling assumption in, in, in essence that the data points in the local data set I are IID draws from a probability distribution, but we do not know it. We just see the realizations. Uh, but there are ways to, to estimate probability distributions. Does anyone know how we could estimate the probability distribution PI only from the, the data points that we assume are IID realizations of this distribution? Density, kernel density. So there, there is a, a big field within machine learning and statistics uh, called density estimation. And this field studies methods that allow to estimate as accurately as possible the probability distribution from IID realizations of the distribution. Okay. Uh, so le let's assume now we, we come up somehow with a, with a distance measure between these probability distributions. And what we then can do is we, we use this distance measure like we would use uh, like we would use Euclidean distances in, in a scatter plot. So we could say the weight the weight of this edge is the, uh, larger if this uh, distance between these two data sets is smaller. Uh, yes. So there was now a question, can we make statistical tests based on uh, like the kolmogorov smirnov test? Yes. So another, so it, it's similar, a similar uh, approach, but not quite the same. So uh, I mean, testing if these two data sets come from the same distribution is, is maybe one of the most elementary problems studied in, in all statistics. So, and there has been a lot of methods developed, including uh, what is known as Kolmogorov-Smirnov test that allows you to, 
to estimate or, or predict if two data sets of data points are drawn from the same distribution or not. However, what we want to do is a bit different because we want to have a quantitative measure for the distance between these two distributions. Of course, if the distance is zero and a reasonable distance distribution is such that it's only zero if these distributions are, uh, is, are the same. So we can, we could also do a test, but we want to do a bit more fine-grained modeling. So we, we not only want to find, put an edge if they are considered from the same distribution, but we want to put an edge and a weight, a weight that reflects the distance between these distributions. Of course, we could always threshold the distance and say if it's too, too large, then we say we estimate they are not similar and there's no edge. So we can always, uh, quantize these distances. So it's related to, to statistical tests, but it's not exactly the same problem. Yes, so once we have uh, such a distance measure between these probability distributions, typically we, we cannot measure exactly the distance, but only estimate this distance because we can only estimate uh, approximations or compute approximation of the probability distributions like uh, using kernel density estimators. Yeah, and then we have different uh, recipes for constructing graphs. So we, one way would be to construct K nearest neighbor graphs. So we would connect each node to its K nearest neighbors. So in this case, K would be two. So we connect node I to its two nearest neighbors. Yeah, and if we, if we would instead use K equal uh, three, we would also add this here. And if we would use k equal four, we would add also this here. Okay. Uh, so this k here is, is an important design parameter, a hyperparameter. This deci decides how many edges the empirical graph will have. Uh, should we make this k as large as possible so that we have as many edges as possible in the empirical graph? No, why not? Yes, because too many edges might result in uh, too much computation of the follow-up federated learning algorithm. Remember the federated learning algorithms that you will find in uh, section nine of the lecture notes, they all are of the type of message passing. So in each iteration, so they're iterative and each iteration amounts to message, message passing, which means for each edge, we have to compute something. We have to do a, a bit of calculations. So the more edges, the more calculations you have to do. And in turn, the larger this K, the higher the computational complexity of the resulting uh, 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 federated learning algorithm. So I don't know, there, there was a question, we should choose some th some threshold for the edges. Yeah, so uh, you, you could say you just connect to the K nearest neighbors and then have each edge weight one, or you uh, you have additionally on top of the of the presence of edges also you define uh, define edge weights which are depending on the on the distance. For example, one possible choice is to use uh, edge weight being uh, what is called the Gaussian kernel e to the minus, and then you take the distance measure between node i and j square. So this is one example for choosing edge weights. But you could use other functions than the exponential here. So this sometimes called kernel, a kernel. Here we would use the exponential function as kernel, graph kernel. Okay. Yeah, so this k is an important design parameter. The larger, the more comp computational complexity. Would it, is it so that, uh, although the computational complexity increases, so this is what we don't want, but from a statistical perspective, from an accuracy perspective, is it beneficial to use K as large as possible? So to use as many edges as possible. No, why not? Well, 
Well, it could be that uh, this, this nodes or local data sets, they form clusters. Yes, and then having many edges means that we uh, require a lot of coupling between any two nodes. So essentially we want to have a, a constant model. We want all local models to, to have the same trained model, which is equivalent to having a single global model. So uh, using a large K is only useful if we want to learn a single global model, an average model. But if we want to learn tailored models for subsets of, of nodes, which have different statistical properties, then uh, using K large would average out any differences and would not be good from a performance perspective. Okay, any other comments regarding this K nearest neighbor construction? Yes, yeah, so instead of K nearest neighbors, we just use a fully connected uh, but weighted graph. So we connect, we put an edge between any two nodes, but each uh, edge has, has a weight. So these weights then are, are kind of a soft, soft indicator if there should be an edge or not. So a drawback here is that uh, the computational complexity is large since per se, you do not know how to exploit the, the detailed distribution of weight values. Per se, you need to pass the computation over all edges. So this is typically uh, computationally intensive, but statistically, even if you have edges between any two pairs, but for some edges, the, these, uh, these weights might be very small. So they might statistically have the same effect as or similar effect as no edge at all. Okay, so these were no basic uh, methods for constructing graphs. I mean, you can use any, any basic method to construct the similarity graph based on Euclidean distance. You just replace the Euclidean distance by a distance measure between uh, these local distributions. So this uh, kind of, uh, brings us to the to the further key question, which is, so how do we know measure the dist, uh, distance between this probability distributions? And I heard already some uh, suggestions. So any other suggestions? Where, where, so this field, the field that studies this is called, as I remember, information geometry. So are there any information geometers here? How do you measure distances between points that are probability distributions? Total variation, yes, very good. Any other suggestions for, for distance measures between distributions? I mean, a distribution per se is, is a function. So it's a function. A function of, of the all possible outcome values of a random variable. So it's a function. And how can we measure distances between functions? Well, there's a whole field called, I think, functional analysis, a big part of chunk of, of mathematics that is distances between functions, but these are special functions, distributions in particular, they must sum to one and they are non-negative. So there are specific choices uh, popular. Total variation and now another one, Wasserstein, Wasserstein or Wasserstein. Apologies for the pronunciation because this is a, a German Russian name where I always have hard time to find the correct pronunciation. Uh, Yes, so Wasserstein, I will talk about in a second. Any other options? As I said, in principle, we can use any distance measure that is used for functions, between functions. So L2, LP, norm. Yeah. So a more basic approach is, of course, to, to, to break down the complexity because this probability distribution, they are high dimensional objects often. They are continuous functions for continuous random variables and high dimensional functions. So if this X here would be the feature vector of a data point, then you might have feature um, number of features being billions, very high dimensional beasts, so to say. 
So one way to break down the complexity is, well, describe a, a distribution by a few numbers, or you could call it features or parameters. So you compute the finite number of parameters like the mean, the expectation, or the variance, or higher order moments, and you stack them into a vector, and then you have a numeric vector of parameters. And then you use distance measures for Euclidean spaces, such as the Euclidean norm. This, by the way, uh, you have done or you should do in the current uh, coding assignment. So in the current coding assignment, you have to uh, compute averages, which are estimations for, or which are like an approximation or estimation for a mean of a distribution and then compute distances between these uh, averages. So that's the parametric approach. The other approach is uh, the more interesting, elegant one, directly equip the space of probability distributions with a distance measure. So what, what can we do here? As I mentioned, this the study of this uh, distance measures on the space of probability distributions is, a, is an, uh, an entire field called information geometry. So I only give a glimpse today of, of what we could do. But just to, to remind you about the basic properties of, of a metric or what is a natural requirement for a distance measure is, first of all, we would like to have a distance measure to be zero uh, when we measure distance between a point or a distribution and itself. Then we would like, typically it's convenient to require distance measure to be non-negative and symmetric. And there's also uh, often required the, the triangle inequality because it's close to our intuition of, of uh, that is developed by Euclidean geometry. But we will see that often we can use distance measures usefully and don't require all of these properties. In particular, uh, one such distance measure, which is called uh, a divergence or a kullback leibler divergence uh, is defined here. So for for random variables of yeah for random variables which take on finite many values or discrete random variables, you can write a, down a definition here. Uh, for random variables which are continuous, take on uh, any real number, then you must replace this summation. Loosely speaking, you must replace this summation with an integral. But I will not go into too much technical details because per se, it's not clear that this expression works well for all possible distributions. So you must be a bit careful uh, to choose a, a, a proper domain or space on which you define this divergence. You, you should only use distributions where this definition works or the, you can define uh, the KL divergence. But I will not go into any of these technical subtleties. This is something you will learn in, in our excellent math and statistics courses offered by the Department of Mathematics. Okay, just an overview of the properties. So it's non-negative and equal to zero only if uh, essentially the two distributions are identical. So this is nice that this we want. However, uh, it's not symmetric in general, and it also doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. So strictly speaking, it's not a metric. It's not a metric. Nevertheless, it turns out that this is a quite useful measure for the distance between uh, 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 between distributions. Did any one of you use already KL divergence in work or research? Who wants to join in my praise of KL divergence? Or who wants to oppose it? Okay, just uh, one special case uh, of the KL divergence where we can find a nice formula for it to co uh, compute it is when these two distributions are multivariate normal distributions. So we can always, so it's always a, a useful approach when you have data sets uh, with data points being numeric quantities that per se are not, not discrete. However, of course, in, in a computer, uh, at least my computer, it only uh, all the, the numbers are, are discrete in, in a certain numeric format. However, we approximate this numeric data as being real numbers. And when you ever have such data points being real numbers, then it might be a good idea to try to fit the Gaussian distribution with some mean and uh, covariance matrix. And as soon as you have estimated such a mean and covariance matrix, you can say, okay, let's assume that the underlying distribution is a Gaussian distribution with this mean and covariance matrix that you have estimated. 
And the kalberg leiber divergence between uh, two such Gaussian distributions is given by this formula. So it might actually be a nice exercise or quiz questions to ask if this is always non-negative. Okay, any questions or comments at this point? Yeah, maybe I should point out that K here, this K here is the dimension of the, the Gaussian distribution. So we assume that this mu, for example, is a vector, a K-dimensional vector. And this covariance matrix is a matrix of shape K by K. And also we need to assume, so this formula only works out if this uh, covariance matrix is invertible. Otherwise we would have problems here with the determinant or with the log of the determinant. Okay. Yes, then another special case is the KL divergence between Bernoulli distributions. So a Bernoulli distribution, is uh, maybe the most simple one uh, for a random variable that takes on values, let's say minus one and one. So a binary random variable. And the Bernoulli distribution is then a, a probability mass function defined on this binary uh, value space. Okay. Yes, and here maybe the main interpretation, at least for me, why I like KL divergence and why it seems to be such a natural choice or measure for distance or for discrepancy between probability distribution is because it has a strong, a very strong and deep relation to statistical tests. In particular, consider uh, you have given, you are given a sequence of, of data points, let's say only feature vectors. So M feature vectors, and you, you are told that these are uh, realizations, IID realizations of some probability distribution. And now you want to find out, so you, you have two candidates. So you want to find out is the distribution either the distribution PI or PJ. Uh, remember that this is already a bit of a simpler case or a simpler setting as, as our federated learning setting in the sense that we somebody provides us two candidates. In, in practice, in, in the in the wild life of a machine learning and federated learning engineer, nobody tells you candidates. You just see local data sets. You just see raw data. So this is a bit easier. But in this uh, simplified setting where you have two candidates, PI and PJ, and you want to find out, does this sequence of numbers come either from distribution PI or distribution PJ? Then you can show that the best possible test has an error that is essentially determined by the kalberg leiber divergence. So only if the KL divergence between these distributions is sufficiently large, you can find uh, reasonable tests. You are able to, to discriminate if these data points come from distribution PI or distribution PJ. On the other hand, if the KL divergence is small, very small, then you have almost no chance to distinguish these two cases. Yeah, this is what, what, um, what I like most about the uh, about the KL divergence because it has this strong intrinsic relation to, to hypothesis testing. Uh, yeah, in other words, if you want a more formal statement of what I just told you, uh, there's a nice formulation in the in my Bible of information theory, I would say, the elements of information theory by Koba and Thomas. So I have ruthlessly copy pasted here this uh, screenshot about the, it's called the chernoff stein lemma. Okay, any comments or questions about this interpretation of KL divergence? Okay, 
Then I continue with another choice for distance, and this is now really a metric. So it, it's a metric, uh, but on the other hand, it looks a bit more complicated. So this is called the Wasserstein, Wasserstein metric. Um, again, I just ruthlessly copy pasted it from Wikipedia. Um, and this is really, as I said, a metric. So it's uh, non-negative. Non it's zero only if these two distributions, they are called here now mu and nu, are identical. Uh, it satisfies the triangle inequality and it's symmetric. And so what uh, what, the, what I would like to point out here is this, this distance measure builds on another distance measure, which is defined on the, the value space. So this mu and nu, they are distributions. They are distributions defined over some sample space or set of possible values that the, the data point can take on. So it could be, for example, the real numbers. So this new, mu and nu, these are distributions. And this d here, this is a distance measure defined on this uh, uh, sample space. On the, could be, for example, the feature space of data points. So what, what is, and this is a big difference to the KL divergence. In the KL divergence, we don't use any notion of distance between different values of this random variable. Just doesn't appear. So in particular, we can use the KL divergence also for, for random variables that have no intrinsic notion of distance. However, if there is an intrinsic notion of distance between different between these different elements, like if they are real numbers, then the Wasserstein metric can uh, exploit this distance or uses this distance for the construction of a distance measure between probability distributions. So this is something uh, conceptually very different from Wasserstein metric and from KL divergence. Wasserstein metrics, they are defined for probability distributions over spaces that are metric spaces themselves. Okay, and one, uh, yeah, again, a special case the Wasserstein metric between Gaussians or multivariate normal distributions. I have shown here the formula. So, so it's again a, a nice closed or nice or not so nice formula depending on or involving the, the means and the covariance matrices of these distributions. And yeah, here, for example, we do not need that these covariance matrices are invertible, by the way. So they can also be non invertible, they only need to be positive semi definite. This is a, a big difference to the KL divergence, which only is defined for Gaussian distributions with invertible covariance matrix. This is not needed for the Wasserstein metric. Okay. So now I've showed you the formula for the Gaussian distributions. Um, and now for the interpretation, this Wasserstein metric has a, a very cute interpretation as uh, the cost or the minimum possible, minimum achievable cost of a transport task. So in this uh, interpretation, we, we, we decompose a distribution into small bricks. So each dis distribution uh, is made up of small elementary events that carry an, a quantum of probability, so to say. So we, we break this distribution function into a collection of small elementary units of probability. You, you can do this using some, uh, some limit procedure. So this is a technical details, but just a rough idea is here that the Wasserstein metric is the minimum possible cost where the cost is measured in uh, the, the distance of moving one of this quantum from location X to location Y. And why do we want to move it? Well, we want to use the, the, the available ensemble of quantums that is used to, to make up the distribution PI. We want to re, rebuild or, or realign these quantums or transport this quanta such that it resembles the other distribution. So at the end of this transport process, all these bricks here are moved from building PI to uh, the suitable location in order to make up uh, to make up the distribution PJ. Why does this work, by the way? Why, why, why do we have always for sure enough bricks in, in PI that we can rebuild PJ? 
why are we never short of bricks or have to, uh, have bricks left over in this process? Why is the number of bricks that we need to build PJ exactly the number of bricks that we need to build PI? Yes, because of the normalization of a distribution, probability distribution, which must integrate to one. Or if we use these bricks, so must sum, the sum of all bricks must be one. And this applies to both. So there's a, a conservation of probability uh, here. Okay, this is wrong. No, I mean sum over the bricks. So let's let's remove this. This might be confusing. Okay, but you got the idea, I hope. And each moving, each uh, move of a brick is uh, is weighted by this distance measure on the sample space. So again, uh, be aware that we use that there are two diff distance measures here. So one distance measure is defined on the on the set of all possible values that the random variable can take on. So this is the 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 base, the mother metric, so to say. And based on this mother metric, we define another metric. And this other metric is defined on the space of all distributions. So in this new space, this distribution would be one point, and this blue distribution would be another point. Okay. Yes, so these are mostly the, the, or the most widely used uh, distance measures so far, either KL divergence or Wasserstein metric. When you look into state-of-the-art or current machine learning research papers, uh, I guess the trend is now really to focus on this Wasserstein metric. This seems to be a, a hot, the, the cool thing now in, in machine learning research. But I myself, I didn't get the, really my hands on it yet. So I don't know why it should be fundamentally better than uh, KL divergence, because KL divergence has this ultimate interpretation of being the quantity that defines how well we can test if a, 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 a sequence of data points comes from one distribution or from another. So this is really the, would say, one of the most elementary problems in, in whole statistics. Uh, but I mean, and also it's it's not clear how how to compare these two because it's it, they are different qualitative animals, so to say. Because in this Wasserstein metric, we also include uh, a, a metric on the on the sample space. So this is also quantitatively different. If if you do not know what this uh, what a good or natural choice for this metric is on the sample space, then you might stick to the KL divergence, which doesn't need such a metric. Okay. Uh, I want to quickly point out another idea or rough idea, so to say, to measure distances. And this is, uh, I mean, ultimately what we're interested in in federated learning is, um, not, is not to measure distances pr between probability distributions. Why do we do it? Why are we interested in? Because we hope from these distances between the probability distributions, we get a good hint on how we should place the edges in the empirical graph. But the ultimate criterion is, of course, the validation errors. The ultimate criterion of all these uh, distance measures is when we use them for uh, building uh, the edges in the empirical graph and use then these edges in GTV minimization, we, we minimize it, we solve this optimization problem and get then uh, local hypothesis maps for each node. How well do they do on a validation set? So this is the ultimate criterion. It's not our ultimate goal is not to come up with accurate estimations of the distance between probability distributions. This is the ultimate goal of uh, a statistics uh, scientist who wants to publish papers about it. And this is also a great work, great job, but that's not our goal in federated learning. In federated learning, we only use distances as a tool to come up with good guesses for the empirical graph. But the ultimate goal is to find models that do well. And so if we stick more to this ultimate goal, then it seems natural to, to use or to, to measure the similarity between local data sets in terms of the effect on training machine learning models. In particular, we could say, uh, we could test if two data sets are similar as follows. We first train a model only on the, on the data set I at node I. 
only on this one. And then we pool, we try out training the model again on the pool data set on both DI and DJ. So we pool these two data sets together and retrain the model. We get a new uh, hypothesis. So this is one hypothesis. And before we got one hypothesis only from DI. And then we measure the difference in the validation or training errors, if we don't have a validation set, maybe just use training errors of the learned hypothesis. And if this difference is small uh, or even negative, so if the validation error of this is now smaller than the validation error of this, then this is an indicator, okay, this data set helped us to train a model. So it might have a small distance or it might be similar and we might put an edge here. Yes, so that's it regarding these distance measures. I have talked about three different uh, types of measures. One is the KL divergence, which has a very natural interpretation in terms of statistical tests or the error, the fundamental error of a statistical test. Then the other one was the Wasserstein metric, which has the interpretation as a optimal transport or solution of an optimal transport problem. And the third way to construct distance measures is via looking at the effect of pooling local data sets together on the training of local models. Okay, any questions at this point? So there's a question, how does D calculated in Wasserstein? So let me go back. Uh, the D in Wasserstein, this D here, I guess you mean this D. Yeah, so this is given, this is given. This is the, the distance measure on the, the set of all values that the data point can take on. So if the data point is characterized by a single numeric feature that is measured as a real number, this D could be uh, the absolute value. So this D could be X minus one absolute value, or could be X minus one. Uh, no, it, it should be, it should be a norm. It should be a norm. Yeah. Okay. So this D is, is a design parameter, so to say, this is a, a design choice. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there's a question, how to choose the final test data? Uh, this is hard to say. So uh, principle, what you could do, in particular in the Federated Learning Project, what you should do, you should split each local data set into three parts, into a validation set, a training set, and uh, a test set. So the training set is what you use to formulate the GTV minimization. So here you use the training set. To build this loss function, you use the training set. The validation set you could then use to choose or to tune the edges and the weights and the lambda. Okay. And you pick then the choice which results in the smallest validation error. So here comes the validation error in. And then once you have chosen optimal choices for this, you run this GTV minimization again using some optimization algorithm. And the, the output that you get then, which are some learned hypotheses, these you apply on a test set, which you neither have used for building up the local loss functions, nor have used to tune or choose between different choices for the edges and weights. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, then thanks for your attention. And I will share also a demo notebook where I illustrate these different metrics for the data sets from the Federated Learning Flavors Quiz with these four data scientists. So I will, this notebook demonstrates how you uh, compute the KL divergence, the Wasserstein distance and the distance between uh, or using the effect on the training error. I will then share the link with you via my courses and Slack. Yeah, 
again, don't hold back any questions on Slack or by email. Otherwise, have a nice rest of Monday. Bye.